Good morning, St. Andrews. Please be seated. Happy Father's Day to everybody. All the fathers, I hope you all got your tea in bed this morning, didn't you? And rather than having to make it. Please switch your phones off. Last week there was three went off and it wakened me. You know, I mean, I can't have that. MHA Sunday, the collection for that was £122.50. We matched that out of the care fund and we sent the cheque away to MHA for £250. Thank you so much for your generosity. Also, um, David Herbert, some of you may not know uh, him because he has been very often here, but he's the URC moderator and he's retiring. And we've sent the vast headquarters have asked for a, 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 if we want a donation. Um, we've sent £50 away for, for that. But if anybody wants to add to that, that knew David, please see Richard. He's the money man. Holly Smith would like to thank the, our friends at St Andrews for their generous support of our 100-mile bike, uh, bike ride. I think she's still recovering. Um, she raised a total of £531 for Alzheimer's in memory of our grandma, Flo. And 165 came from here. So thank you, every one of you. And you'll notice that Gavin's got a poorly leg today, so be gentle with him, will you? <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Betty. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's coming through now. Wonderful. Yeah, good, good to see you all. Uh, I apologise. I'm sitting down to, to lead the service today. I've, uh, I've injured my leg, uh, which is why I'm preaching wearing Crocs and sitting down. I can't get my shoes on. Uh, so uh, uh, forgive me for that. Other than that, I'm absolutely fine. So don't worry about me. I don't need any sympathy, but... Uh, but uh, <laughs> But uh, this is a, a different experience sitting down uh, to lead it today. Uh, so uh, as we gather in the name of Jesus in this place, we know that God is present with us and we know that we uh, are accepted as we are, that God accepts our worship as we are. So let's choose to bring every part of ourselves to all that God is to worship with all that we are and give ourselves completely to the one who is worthy. We sing together, come now is the time to worship. It's number 24 in the books and there on the screen as well.
Let us pray. A loving God, we come just as we are, drawn by you to worship you. We come once more reminded of all that you are and all that you have done of the love with which you have surrounded us. The grace you have shown us through Jesus Christ. The purpose you have for our lives. We come to offer you our praise, to declare again your mighty acts, to marvel at your greatness, and to commit ourselves to your service. We come to give thanks and to rejoice in all that you've given us, to respond to your goodness and offer you our love in return. And we come to make our confession, to admit our faults and failings, to recognise our weakness and to ask for your forgiveness. We come to seek your guidance, to discern your will, to find the strength that we need to live as your people. We come to make our offering. To bring all of ourselves to you. And we come to worship you in the conviction that you are here with us now. That you are by our side always. That you hold all things and all people in your hands. So as we reach out to you. Reach out to us, we pray, and fill every moment of every day with the light of your love and the peace of your presence through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. We're going to hear our readings from the scriptures now. Firstly from the Epistle to the Romans and then from the Gospel of Matthew. The first reading is from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. And you can find this on page 192 of the New Testament. Now that we have been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us by faith into this experience of God's grace in which we now live. And so we boast of the hope we have of sharing God's glory. We also boast of our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance brings God's approval and his approval creates hope. This hope does not disappoint us. For God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. For when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Amen. You'll find our second reading on page 14 of the New Testament section. Matthew chapter 9, and we begin at verse 35. Jesus went round visiting all the towns and villages. He taught in the synagogues, preached the good news about the kingdom, and heal people with every kind of disease and sickness. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them, because they were worried and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. <coughs> so he said to his disciples, The harvest is large, but there are few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. Jesus called his twelve disciples together and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, the sons of Zebedee, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the patriot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. These 12 men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan town. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Go and preach. The kingdom of God is near. Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases and drive out demons. You have received without paying, so give without being paid. Amen. And thank you God for the privilege.
in our gospel reading. It begins before Jesus uh, calls and sends out his disciples on mission. Uh, that as Jesus looked on the crowds, uh, in some translations he had pity on them, in some that he had compassion on them. As we gather here, we gather as those on whom Jesus has compassion. And we gather as those who Jesus calls to have compassion on those he calls us to serve. We also are reminded with those words from uh, the epistle to the Romans that God has poured out his love into <coughs> our hearts and we seek more and more for our words and deeds to be motivated by that love and compassion. And we're going to sing together, it's number 627 in singing the faith, everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is. find me all my fears and failures fill my life again give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole In the Humour family at the moment, there are lots of people on diets. <laughs> and why might this be? What has motivated this recent dieting fad? Is it because we've all suddenly decided 
that we're more concerned about our health than we used to be. No. It's because my son is getting married in a couple of months' time and we're all desperate to make sure that we can get in to our wedding outfits. <laughs> Sometimes our motives for doing things can be mixed. When my wife, Tracy, moved to Gisborough at the age of 13, she was deciding which church to go to. Uh, where she'd moved from, uh, she'd been in an ecumenical church in Welling uh, that was combined C of E, Methodist and URC. So what was it that motivated her decision to go to Gisborne Methodist Church rather than the C of E or the URC Church? Was it the worship? Was it the teaching? Was it the music? No, it was the fact that there were more boys at the Methodist <laughs> Church. And thankfully for me, I was one of them. We can be motivated by all kinds of things. Sometimes doing good things for less than perfect reasons. Sometimes people who go on to achieve amazing things in life will often have a story about what has motivated them. Sometimes that story might include a childhood incident where somebody said to them, you'll never amount to anything. And so they've been motivated their whole life by trying to prove that person wrong. You would hope that the majority of people who go into government or politics would do so motivated by some degree of public service. But often the motivations and the achievements of the good ones get obscured by others who seem to be motivated by something else. No names need to be mentioned at this stage. Now, of course, it's easy to look down on others and to think, well, I'm not like them. But what are we motivated by? By the carrot or the stick, by hope or by fear? I mean, if I'm honest, there is a mixture of motivations in the things that I do. Some good, some less so. There are some aspects of what I do as a minister that I think I might struggle to motivate myself to do as a volunteer. And other parts that I'd gladly do and gladly used to do as a volunteer before I went into full-time ministry. In truth, we are all motivated by a complex mixture of things, good and bad. But as Christians, we are called to seek to be motivated more and more by love and compassion, and less and less by selfishness and fear and all kinds of unacknowledged negative biases. And part of the challenge of our gospel reading today is what is our motive as a church for mission? What is the motivation for our mission? Is our motivation sometimes mixed, sometimes compromised? We're motivated by the desire sometimes to put seats on the, the, the yeah, put people on the seats in our chapel because we want more people, because we want our church to be full and successful, or because otherwise we might be in danger of closing. It's all too easy for our motivation to become something for our sake rather than the sake of those we're reaching out to. And we see in our gospel passage today the highest motive for mission. When Jesus 
So the people around him. The Bible tells us he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And the word used in the Greek apparently means that he was moved in his guts. He was stirred deep inside. Is that what happens to us? When we think about the people in our communities who have yet to discover the love of Jesus for themselves. So I think that means that the starting point for our mission is to ask God to help us to feel the heart of compassion that we see in Jesus Christ for those that we're called to serve. And because we're human, we have to acknowledge our tendency to be motivated by other things. That in our humanness, we can get tired. We can get cynical. We can get hard-hearted. And we need to keep asking God to soften our hearts and to help us to feel the compassion of Christ. So the motivation for mission is the compassion of Christ. Secondly, the magnitude of the mission requires everyone to play their part. Jesus goes on to say to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Jesus gives a picture of a farmer watching and waiting for the field of wheat to ripen. And when it does, there's only a short window of time to gather the harvest while it's still in good condition. And when the harvest is large, lots and lots of helpers are needed who will work to gather it in. Modern combine harvesters have large floodlights on the top of the cabin so that they can work through the night. And if you happen to spend any time in the countryside at harvest time, and if it's been a a fine day but there's a, a poor forecast for the following day, you might end up being kept awake at night by those bright floodlights and the sound of farm machinery. But these are important because often that small window of time is the one opportunity. And there's a need for all attention, all resources to be focused on that one task, to bring in the harvest before the rain arrives. And the task that Jesus gives us is a bit like that. It's a huge task that requires everyone to play their part. But perhaps the sense of magnitude and urgency can sometimes overwhelm us. Even paralyze us into inactivity. Because it seems just too big. And we feel so small in comparison. But there is something that we can do. Firstly, we can do what Jesus said we do first. And that is to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into the harvest field. In the face of the magnitude of the mission... Prayer is where we're called to start. But also if we look at the example of Jesus, we can see that Jesus started small, just a small group of disciples. And as Jesus tells them to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers out, surely at least one of them must have twigged. Oh dear. 
I think he might be talking about us. He might mean us, you know. We're the ones we're actually praying for. And although we might be sometimes tempted to pray, rather than, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, send her, send him, send them, Lord. The means for the mission is through ordinary people like us hearing the call of God. After urging the disciples to pray for workers for the harvest to be sent out, they then are the beginning of the answer to that prayer as Jesus sends them out to the surrounding villages and towns. Sometimes when we pray about something or for something, God prompts us. Yes, I mean you. You're asking God to do something about that? Well, I'm calling you and empowering you to make a start. And sometimes when we think to ourselves, someone really ought to do something about this or that. Well, perhaps the reason that you have noticed that something needs to be done is because God is calling you to do something about it. Jesus calls ordinary people to be part of his mission team. But sometimes we might question the choice that Jesus makes in people like us. I wonder if any of you have seen those match of the day specials with Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer and Micah Richards as they pick their top tens of uh, people. Sometimes they've been picking their all-time dream team of the best possible starting 11 from all the players that they played with during their career. I think it's fair to say that the choice of disciples that Jesus makes were not a dream team. They were not the best of the best. They were ordinary people like you and me. So what part are we being called to play in the harvest of the kingdom? And finally, a method for the mission. One field at a time. In telling the disciples where to go as they start their mission, Jesus says something that seems a bit puzzling at first. He says, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. What? Why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus limit the mission? Surely Jesus cared about the Gentiles. Surely Jesus cares about the Samaritans. Surely they need to hear the good news too. And it's especially jarring in the light of recently hearing on the Sunday after Ascension Day about Jesus telling the disciples that they will be witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And on Pentecost Sunday about the Spirit <laughs> enabling the disciples to speak in languages of many different nations and the Spirit being poured out on all people. And then on Trinity Sunday two weeks ago we had that bit from the end of Matthew's Gospel known as the Great Commission where the disciples are called to go and make disciples of all nations. So why on earth is the mission limited here in Matthew chapter 9? Perhaps for practical and pragmatic reasons. The disciples were Jews. They'd only been learning from Jesus for a very short time. And so at this stage they were not yet ready 
to preach the good news to the Gentiles. They weren't yet equipped to go into the whole world. And so they called to start with what they know. To start with those they can more easily connect with and communicate to. The mission to the Gentiles would come later with a bit of help from the Apostle Paul. But there may be another practical reason why Jesus limits the mission at this point. And that may be the fact that their mission would be more effective if it is focused in. If they could direct their energy to one thing rather than spreading themselves too thinly. We're all familiar with that phrase, don't bite off more than you can chew. And perhaps that's part of what Jesus is saying here. There needs to be a method, a strategy to the mission. Because it simply isn't possible for a limited number of people to do everything all at once. And so limited resources need to be focused on something specific in order to be effective. Collect the harvest one field at a time. Just like different crops might be ready for harvest at different times of the year. So I wonder if this gives us two important questions to ask in our mission today. Firstly, who are we called and best equipped to reach here and now? Where is our starting point? Who are the people that we have connections with or friendships with? or links with that we need to start with? And secondly, what about where we focus our time and energy and resources? Do we sometimes spread ourselves too thinly? Could we be more effective if our energy was focused on the most important things? The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. So which small part of that harvest field is ours to gather in? Let's pray that Jesus will show us. Provide others to join us and fill us with his heart of compassion. For those he calls us to serve. And so as we seek to be motivated by the love and compassion of Christ. And to be less and less motivated by those lesser things. Such as greed or fear or all kinds of other mixed motives, we're going to sing together. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love, tender and true. Number four, four, three, and also on the screen. Jesus.
Let us pray. Lord, lift our hearts till they rise above envy and falsehood and pride, selfishness and greed, and fill our hearts with your love, with your compassion. Lord Jesus, we thank you for those you have called to follow you across the years. And for those who have had the courage to respond in faith. Help us to be ready to respond in turn. And willing to commit ourselves to your service. And to walk in your way. The way of the cross. When you ask us to venture into the unknown. To be strong, courageous, obedient and faithful. Living Lord, help us to say yes. when you ask us to listen to your voice, to your word that confronts, challenges, teaches and inspires. When you ask us to reach out in love to the indifferent, the hostile, To those we find it hard to love. Living Lord, help us to say yes. When you ask us to let go of self. To share. To care. To give. To sacrifice. When you ask us to go out in your name, to speak, to work, to love and to live for you. Living Lord, help us to say yes. Lord Jesus Christ, as you called the apostles at the start of your ministry, and as you have called so many others since, so your call comes to us today, urging us to respond in faith and to share the work of your kingdom. And Lord, as we remember that you called us to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. And as we recognise the magnitude of the mission to which you have called us and our sense of inadequacy for that task. Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us and show us the small part that we play alongside of us. And we pray that you would help us to recognise those parts of the harvest field that you call us to gather in. And Lord Jesus, we bring to you those people and situations that have touched our hearts in recent days. 
those stories of people far away who we will never meet. And yet whose stories have caused our hearts to feel something of the compassion that you feel. For those fleeing places of violence and persecution, whose lives were lost at sea. For those who continue to live their lives in places that are war zones around the world. For those in our country, in our communities, who are struggling at this time. Especially those struggling in the midst of this cost of living crisis. And we also pray for those we know personally. Among our circle of family and friends. Those in our church family, those in the places where we live, Lord, we offer our prayers to you. Pray that you would bring these people uh, your comfort, your healing, your strength. And we pray that if in the coming days we might be the answer to these prayers and the prayers of others that you would prompt us in our speaking and in our living. And we offer to you ourselves and our own needs and concerns and especially those for this coming week. And we pray that you would strengthen us, that we might serve you as your witnesses, even in the midst of our struggles and our joys. We ask all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We worship God as we... Offer our gifts, our offering will be brought forward as a symbol of all the giving in the life of our church. Gracious God, the gifts on this table are a symbol of all the giving in the life of this church. We offer the gift of our money. We offer the gift of our time and our talents. We offer the gift of our service. For Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen. We we'll sing together hymn number 713, also on the screen. Show me how to stand for justice.
since this is our first communion Sunday uh, since Pentecost, we're going to use the, uh, uh, the liturgy uh, for Pentecost for our communion today. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptised into one body. Let us therefore keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. A reading from the letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. The teaching that I gave you is the same teaching that I received from the Lord. On the night when Jesus was handed over to be killed, he took bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke the bread and said, This is my body. It is for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, after they ate, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup shows the new relationship with God and his people. This new relationship begins with the blood of my death. When you drink this, do it to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show others about the Lord's death until he comes. Loving God, we meet to remember and celebrate your love for us all, shown in the death and resurrection of Jesus and in the giving of your spirit. By this gift of power and love, you lead us into all truth. You make us into a people who praise you in our daily lives and give us the power to share the good news of Jesus. So we offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. Share this meal with us. Send your Holy Spirit on us. Deepen our communion with you and each other. We say together the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. <coughs> now the invitation to share is not just to those gathered here in this place, but also to those of you joining us online, and you might like to get yourself a piece of bread and some juice if you're joining us online and join with us in the sacrament from where you are. Jesus invites us all to come to this table, not because we are worthy, but because we need the forgiveness he freely offers. And because we need the power of his spirit to live our lives for him. 
So come, because you love the Lord a little and want to love him more. Come, because he loves you and gave himself for you. And come to open your life to his grace and power. Those from the junior church going to the morning is no. That's fine. So today you will be served in your seats by our communion students. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to, when you uh, receive a piece of bread, you hold on to it until we've all got a piece of bread and then we'll all eat together uh, and the same uh, when you receive the wine. We'll all drink. The body of Christ is broken for us.
blood of Christ is shed for us. Amen. Let us pray. God of power, may the boldness of your Spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your Spirit lead us. And may the gifts of your Spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. Final hymn is number 596, and the words also on the screen, 596. Now let us from this table rise. Spirit of truth, lead us into all truth. Give us grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and to proclaim the word and works of God, and the blessing of God, Spirit, Son, and Father, remain with us always. Amen. We go into the world in the power of the Spirit to fulfil our high calling as servants of Christ. Thanks be to God.